you very much, gentlemen. Take your Bibles tonight and join me in turning to the book of Exodus this evening. Exodus chapter number 14. Exodus chapter number 14. It's certainly good to be back with you here at Calvary and so glad that I could bring the College Ensemble with us tonight, uh, led by Mr. Todd Scoville, his wife Brenda. They've traveled all uh, over the last 10 days uh, with these young people. We've been in different places every night, uh, basically. And uh, after the service this evening, we'll head back to Ambassador, and uh, we'll begin our Bible conference, our Spring Bible Conference, tomorrow morning. And that begins at 950 and so these young people, while they've uh, certainly been on the go, they've been a great blessing to me personally. The Scovels have uh, been a great blessing as well as we've been able to minister together. And uh, glad that we could spend our last service of the tour with you, you folks tonight. I just want to say a word about Ambassador. You folks are no strangers. Uh, you folks have a heartbeat uh, for seeing people trained for the Lord's work. The Lord's given us a great... Uh, school year. We're in the midst now of our spring semester, uh, still believing that there is an important uh, ministry to be accomplished in training the next generation for full-time Christian service. Uh, I say that not for just the benefit of you praying for ambassador, but the ministry that God's given you here. Uh, it's a very important one. And uh, we live in a day and time where there's, uh, there's more Bible illiteracy in society and even in our churches. Uh, where society has pressed against our churches. We assume that our young people know everything, when in reality, uh, there's much for them still to have learnt, to learn. And uh, so in the Bible college setting, we're able to pour all the Bible we can in four years into our students. Listen, there's no better book to train preachers and their wives in than the Bible. And that's why we take our students from Genesis to Revelation, book by book in the classroom. That's why they're taught... Uh, by experienced faculty members. That's why they're taught the importance of the local church. Uh, that's why they are uh, taught uh, good old-fashioned conservative Christian music. Uh, we uh, want our young people to go out and to do the work of the Lord. We want them to go out and to serve Him uh, in the power of the Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're here tonight, I just say to every teenager here, uh, if you're here this evening and God has called you into some aspect of full-time Christian service, uh, it may be that God would lead you to ambassador. It may be that you'll be here at Calvary in the school here. Uh, we want you to be where God wants you to be. But remember this, a call to the ministry is a call to prepare. And uh, one of the things, while I'm not preaching on it tonight, one of the things I want to constantly do is to tell young people, listen, God is still calling young men to preach the gospel. Uh, God is still calling young ladies who will have the faith of a Susanna Wesley and serve wherever God would have her serve. And uh, the world has an awful strong pull today. Now the truth is it always has. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Admittedly, uh, the world has always had a strong pull. Uh, but young people, I want you to know, there's more to life than making money and having the nicest toys. Uh, one day all those things are going to pass. And the only thing you're going to have to lay at his feet are crowns. There'll be no iPhones. Uh, no androids. Uh, there'll be no technology. Listen, at that moment, uh, the only thing that's going to matter is what have you done to last for eternity. And so I hope you keep that in mind. Stop by the table after the service this evening. A variety of music items and things from the college. And there's several new books that I would like to mention. Uh, we want to put good resources in the hands of God's people. And some of our faculty members have finally... I don't know if I should say put their pen to paper or their hands to keyboards. I'm not sure how it works. But they've finally done some writing. And uh, there are several books back there that I would encourage you to take a look at. One is by our, one of our faculty members, Dr. Charles Surrett, on how to find the will of God. Now, did you know that there are some things the Bible says are very plain? It's God's will for you. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, there's some things the Bible says, hey, you are not to do this, and you are to do this. No more discussion. But do you know there's also areas of your life where you're looking, and you're like, man, I'm just not quite sure what to do. Did you know that God gives you some principles to figure it out? If you'll acknowledge Him in all of your ways, He'll direct your paths. 
And uh, so this book is a tremendous resource. It goes in depth a little bit uh, and some stories and areas about the will of God that would be of particular interest to you. Another couple of books written by Dr. Ernest Childs. He's one of our fi founding faculty members. Uh, Brother Childs wrote a book entitled The Gates of Jerusalem, which is a devotional Bible study through the gates of Jerusalem back in the Old Testament era and making modern day application for believers. It'd be a great challenge. Uh, to you, be very interesting for some of you Bible students. And then another one that he's written is Journey to Joy and chronicling the travels of the nation of Israel and telling you that just as Israel was able to find joy in the Lord, you can too. And it takes you through the stories uh, of the nation of Israel. Now, I don't know about you. Some of you say, well, I need money. I want money. Listen, I hope all of you want joy. But there's only one way you can get that, that kind of joy that's lasting, and that's through God Himself. And that's exactly what that book points you to. So those books are on the back table, and uh, I would encourage you to stop by and to see those and uh, ask the gentleman after the service, and they'll help you any way that they can. Uh, another thing that I would mention, the offering that will be received for the college, uh, that will go specifically towards what we call our graduation offering. Uh, we're asking the Lord uh, to do for us and meeting the needs of the school so that we don't have to exorbitantly raise the tuition rates for our students and our goal is $100,000 by the end of May. And uh, so what we're asking the Lord to do is to provide that through local churches and friends. And uh, so the offering at the end of that will go specifically towards that project to help us with that. Uh, we believe in our students and we want to try to do all that we can to ease their burden. And uh, by getting that help in the general budget, it helps us uh, to not have to do anything in excess that would really increase the financial burden on our students. All right, and then with all of that said, one last thing is uh, it was a joy to see your pastor before the service and was able to spend a little time with him. And uh, I want you to know as a preacher, I'm very grateful for the love and the uh, patience uh, that you folks have uh, exhibited towards Brother Broy Hill. Listen, you know where a shepherd wants to be? He wants to be among his sheep. And uh, that's a little bit torturous. I know right now he's experiencing... Uh, the physical issues, and we've certainly been praying for them down our way, but there's, there's a whole spiritual dimension of that, and uh, being around your sheep. And uh, so, but just sitting with him for a few moments this afternoon, it's obvious that uh, you folks hold a special place in his heart, and uh, I'm just glad that uh, he was able to sit up and talk for a little bit. So you continue to pray for him. Uh, I was telling him, when he and I first met years ago, when he was pastoring in Lenore, North Carolina, we had no idea what we signed up for. At that time, we had no idea of whether it's the blessings, the adversities, any of that. It just sort of humored us a little bit to think of that. And, but don't laugh too hard. The same's true for you. And, uh, but I promise you that as a child of God, the Lord will be there every step of the way. And uh, so I thank you so much for your kindness that you've exhibited to Pastor. That's a special encouragement to me. Well, I hope you found uh, Exodus chapter 14. Now, some of you have already started your preaching clock on my preaching time. Shame on you, all right? I was trying to tell you about the Lord's work a little bit and trying to tell you about your pastor. So now you can start your preaching clock, all right? And uh, you can start that up. In just a moment, I'm going to read a passage to you, and after I read the passage, I want to preach on a subject that I believe is a besetting sin among Christians today. Somebody might say, well, I know what he's going to preach on. He's going to preach about this technology business. Boy, there's a lot of that going on, and a lot of things that are happening in the wrong way, but that's not it. Somebody else say, I bet you he's going to preach against watching uh, the wrong things. Well, there's certainly a time and place for that to be preached. I read just a couple of weeks ago a sermon by Billy Sunday. Had Billy Sunday said the words that he said in the 1930s in pulpits in 2017, average church would have run him out on a rail. He preached so hard against sin, but it was good. Some of you say, well, I bet you he's going to preach about uh, drinking. He's going to preach about immorality. Listen, those things are certainly have their place to be preached against. But I want to preach to you about a sin tonight that I believe besets... A lot of Christians and churches just like Calvary Baptist Church, you say, preacher, what is that? Very simply this, doubting God. I know we don't view that as a sin. We view that as a human emotion, as a human reaction. But would you do me a favor and for about the next 35 minutes, would you just peel off your plastic mask? 
and admit tonight that you're a human being that has the capacity to doubt God. I never one time in my life can ever recall an instance where I doubted the existence of God. Never one time. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Listen, any person on the face of the earth to have testimony that there is a God, all they have to do is look at the stars that He hung every night. But I have to hang my head this evening and tell you, while there's never been a time in my life I've ever doubted the existence of God, there have been times in my life where I doubted God. And so we find the nation of Israel doing tonight. Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 10, the Bible says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now you might say tonight, Preacher, why do you read it that way? Because I believe they said it that way. I don't believe tonight they said, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us to... No. I think they said it with feeling. I think they said it with a little bit of disgust. Their hearts rooted in disbelief. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. When we read this passage, it's relatively early in the history of Israel, comparatively speaking. I mean, after all, we're only in the second book of the Bible. Really, if you want to talk about the beginning of the history of Israel, God reveals Himself to a man named Abram in Ur of the Chaldees. He says, Abram, follow me. And he follows God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. And the journey began. One day, God looks at Abraham, and He says, Abraham, I've got a special promise for you. Through you, I'm going to raise up a nation, a nation that is going to be unable to be numbered. There'll be so many that will follow after your seed. Why, Abraham, look at those stars. You see those stars? Your seed will be like the stars. Well, I'm sure Abraham took that promise and he embraced it, but there came a point in Abraham's life where he said, the biological clock is ticking. But eventually, the promised son would come in a miraculous fashion. Abraham, at the young old age of about a hundred, Sarah, about to break ninety, and they have a bouncing baby boy, his name Isaac. And God would take that young man Isaac, and he would raise up a nation through Abraham and Isaac. And then we find Jacob and Esau being born. What a unique relationship they had, quite contentious at times. After all, one steals the birthright. Jacob has twelve children. One of them stands out. His name, Joseph. Joseph, after being thrown in a pit, after being thrown into Pharaoh's pit prison, finds himself in Pharaoh's palace. And now God has elevated him to the point where he is delivering the nation of Israel out of bondage, out of rather, I should say, famine. Saves his own family. But then the Pharaoh that knew Joseph died. And something bad happened. The next Pharaoh begins to look around and he strokes his chin and he says, We've got a problem. There are more of them than us. So we're going to enslave them. We're going to make them work hard. We're going to make their lives miserable. We want them to know that Egypt is number one and everybody of Abraham's seed is inferior. And they did that for a long, long time. 
And then God raises up a man by the name of Moses. A man not, you wouldn't find more meek of a man in all the earth than Moses. God raises up this young boy. He puts him out on a bu- uh, puts him out on a little basket out on the on the river. He shows up at Pharaoh's daughter's house. He gains favor with her. He's raised in the finest of Egyptian tutelage. And one day he kills an Egyptian for abusing an Israelite, and he has to run. He flees. Moses finds himself on the backside of a desert for forty years, primarily hearing this. No longer Pharaoh's apple of the Pharaoh's eye. Now he's a shepherd working in a wilderness out in the middle of nowhere. And finally, God reaches down and says, Moses, it's your time. He gets his attention through a burning bush. The bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. Moses makes up every excuse in the book. Finally, God says, Moses, that's enough. Go. And he does. Moses shows up, he meets the Pharaoh, and he meets him in an unusual way. His message is this, not how are you doing, not we bring you great tidings of great joy. It's simply this, Jehovah said, let my people go. Not the politically correct message of the day. After folding his arms and sulking and pouting and going in every which direction, finally God had a way of getting Pharaoh's attention, especially when his firstborn dies. And now the day has come, Pharaoh says, Get out of here as soon as you can. Get out of my sight. I never want to see you again. And while Egypt is standing still in shock and awe of the plagues of God, Israel takes everything they can with them, and they are making their way of escape. But then Pharaoh changes his mind. The more he thinks about it, the more he wants to kill the whole crew. He sends his armies. He says, I want you to go after Israel, and I want you to destroy them. And now Israel finds themselves in a great quandary. God has raised up a mighty deliverer to bring them out of Egypt. And now in front of them, they see the Red Sea. Behind them, they hear the armies of Pharaoh. Now here's our problem in our 2017 mindset. We read this, now we're all hyper-spiritual. We all, we're armchair quarterbacks. There's some of you men here, you watch football. It's interesting, you know everywhere the receiver ought to throw it. Why, why aren't you a coach somewhere? It's easy to call the shots when a linebacker is not breathing down your throat. We all sit there and shake our heads and say, Israel, why in the world would you just balk? I mean, God did this much for you. I mean, He had all these plagues and He got Israel's attention and did it in a supernatural way. And now, Israel, you're doubting God. What's wrong with you? You Listen, if that's you tonight, I say there's something wrong with you. Because you're made of the same flesh and blood. And we find tonight Israel doubting God. Basically, they say, we'd be better off back in Egypt. We knew we should have never left. But just like Israel doubted God, listen, this room tonight has people in it. You're struggling in the innermost part of your soul. Listen to me, whether you want to tell other people or not. You don't doubt the existence of God, but you're doubting God Himself. And can I tell you, the sooner you admit it and realize where you're at and put your faith and trust back into the God of heaven, the better off you'll be. And so tonight, I'm not going to bring to you a homiletical masterpiece, that's for sure. If Brother Surrett saw this outline, he would just spit on it. He was my homiletics teacher. There's no alliteration much to it tonight. But let me give you five or six statements tonight about doubting God that I hope at some form, some root, it takes hold in your soul and that God will use it like a salve tonight to help not only open the wound, but to heal it. Number one is this. Everyone in this room is capable of doubting God. 
Every person in this room, listen to me, is capable of doubting God. There's nobody excluded. You say, well, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I say, bless your heart. You say, I've been a deacon in this church for a long time. We'll get you a badge. You say, preacher, I have you to know. I do this and I do that. Listen, that is all great, but that doesn't exclude anybody in this room from doubting God. Listen to me. Abraham doubted God. Are you any better than him? He's traveling down to Egypt. They see his wife and they say, boy, she's something. She's a real looker. We think we'll take her to Pharaoh. He's like, oh, I don't want them to kill me. Hey, just tell them that you're my sister. Let's, let's not divulge this wife business because he may kill me. God said, listen, I'm going to promise you a young man and your seed's going to go through that young man and listen, I'm going to raise up a nation. And what happens? Well, somewhere when, when he's drawing Social Security, he begins to doubt God. <laughs> you know, this isn't physically possible anymore. And Ishmael comes on the scene. You say, why are you pointing out Abraham's flaws tonight? I'm not pointing them out because I'm kicking a man because he's down. I'm just saying there's some of us in this room tonight, it'd do us well to look around and say, you know what, if I've got doubting God in my heart, I'm in good company because Abraham did it. That doesn't mean that justifies it. It just ought to break down your weakness a little bit. It's okay to admit tonight you've got a weakness. Moses doubted God. Let me ask you, if you'd seen a burning bush that was burning and was not consumed, do you think you'd get the message, and if God said, I want you to climb Pilot Mountain on your hands, you'd say, I I'd do it, because I mean, if God can make a bush do that, why, I'm telling you, God can help me do anything. That's what you think you'd say. Listen, Moses saw such a miracle, and he's still making excuses with God. Just like people in churches today, just like young people today, they make excuses why they can't serve the Lord. They say, well, I, I'm not very, very, very good, 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 good at speech. Hey, neither was Moses. Moses said, I'm not eloquent. God said, I didn't care about your vocabulary. I just want you to go. Some of you tonight, you're good at excuse making. Some of you in the Christian school, man, dog ate your homework, computer blew up. I bet you there are more printers in King, North Carolina that are defective on assignment days than any other place in America. Oh, the inkjet cartridge jammed or the laser jet or the dinosaur parked in the driveway. On and on you go. Moses, in his faithlessness, he, asked God, he gave God excuse after excuse. What about Israel? God gave them manna. They still faltered. You think about it. Ma'am, how would you like it every day? You say, honey, you want something to eat? Go outside and get all you want. Man, just eat it all day long. Just get you a whole big pot of it. You say, boy, you didn't have to worry about the menu. You didn't have to worry about all kinds of food preparation. It's out there. Manna, get it. But you know, even after a while, Israel faltered in their faith and they began to doubt God. But people like you and me doubt God. I'm talking about Christians that have been saved for 20 years, doubting God. You've been brought to a point in your life where you say, God, where are you? I'm talking about teenagers. At this realm of your life, you look around and say, Why is this way? God, why are you allowing this to happen? When you look through the Bible, you'll find that you're in imperfect company. And everybody in this room is capable of doubting God. But number two tonight, I want to remind you this. That doubt will cause you to love the bondage of Egypt more than the deliverance of God, if you're not careful. How do you know when somebody is doubting God? Let me say it again. Doubt will cause you to love the bondage of Egypt more than the deliverance of God. It's very, very vividly found in verse number 11. When they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? How do you know when somebody doubts God? Is it when they have low church attendance? Possibly. How do you know when somebody doubts God? 
Is it when they just totally quit on God? Well, I, I suppose. But I want to tell you tonight that the, the uh, symptoms of doubting God, they can be recognized much sooner than when they go out the door for the last time. This is what I mean. You know how you can tell when a person doubts God? When he sits in a church pew out of duty and has big question marks in his mind about what God is doing, and even though he's wearing a suit and tie, even though she may be wearing a dress, and they're sitting there listening to the preaching, the question marks and things like this enter their minds. Boy, you know, years ago, even before we were saved or before we got serious about God, I mean, life sure seemed a lot easier. Why? Man, it seems like following this God thing, I'll tell you, just like every bad thing comes my way. But I, t 20 years ago, I, I didn't have this problem. You begin to look back at Egypt. And say, boy, life sure seemed a lot easier there. Now, let me ask you a question. Was life really easier for Egypt, and for Israel in Egypt? I think some of those Israelite mamas forgot the lashes that went on their little boys' backs whenever that taskmaster was unpleased and said, I want you to make more bricks and you're not doing it. Whack! I think some people forgot about weeping fits that they had as they watched their families destroyed by the brutality. But it's amazing how the devil, so to speak, plays with your mind. And all of a sudden you encounter a hardship as a child of God. And yes, it may seem well nigh impossible. And the devil wants you to believe that if you could just go back to the way things used to be, everything would be great when just the opposite's true. I'm talking to people here tonight before God reached down and saved you. Listen to me. You would have destroyed yourself had you continued in that path. Don't you believe for a minute the devil's lie saying, I'll tell you what, now's the time to bail out of Calvary Baptist Church and now's the time to turn your back on God. Go back to when you had fun. Go back to when you had all the material possessions that you wanted. Because the devil never reminds you. He never says, go back to the sadness that you had. He never says, go back to the way where you almost lost your family. Why don't you go back there to where you almost killed yourself because you were consumed of your own lust? But you know how we doubt God? I'll tell you, oftentimes we sit in a chair and the foolish thought enters our mind. Boy, life sure seems like it would have been better on that side of the fence. When in reality, everything without Calvary was dark Amen. Amen. and drear and absolutely hopeless. Listen, I'm not talking down to any of you tonight. There's some of you here and you'd say, Preacher, I'll be quite honest. I've hit such a skid in my life. That has actually entered my mind. And I just want to say, listen on. Doubting God tonight. But number three... When we focus on the visible, we doubt the invisible. Now the world says that's absolutely foolish. You don't focus on the invisible, you focus on the visible. I mean, let's be honest, if you're walking to Walmart, everybody goes to Walmart, except for husbands like me that try to avoid it like the plague. You go into Walmart, and let's say you find somebody, and they're like this. And you say, what are you looking at? They said, I'm looking at things that I can't see. I'm thinking, I want to get a couple aisles away from you. <laughs> I mean, really, that's, that's our human nature, is it not? I'm not here to... Encourage people to be foolish and be spaced out. I, I'm not. But there's one, one inescapable fact for every Christian. Here it is, and it's in the Bible. I didn't say it. God did. Hey, we've got to walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. Let me tell you my problem as a child of God. Too often I focus on the things that I can see rather than the one that I cannot. 
Don't you be too hard on these Israelites. There's some of us in this room. We could hear and smell and see the armies of Pharaoh more than the hand of God. While the world calls it foolish, when the things of the visible are more real to me than the things of the invisible, I'm a candidate to, d to doubt God. I know some of you may write me off tonight and you say, Oh, I'll tell you what, uh, this guy's absolutely crazy. But you can read it for yourself. The Egyptians, they're pinning the nation of Israel against the Red Sea. But you know, here's something that Israel didn't understand, didn't know, and here it was. They didn't know every facet of how God was working behind the scenes. And by the way, God doesn't have to tell us that. He's not obligated to. I would have loved it if I'd have been an Israelite. God come to me and said, hey, buddy, it's going to be okay. See that man with that rod there? He's going to raise it in a minute. And when he does, you're going to see something like you've never seen before. I'm telling you, it's going to be dry ground. You're going to go across. You don't have to worry about the mud. It's going to be dry ground. And all of you are going to go across, and right as the nation of Israel gets in that mess, I'm going to bring the water down on them and kill the whole bunch. Don't you worry. That's not what God did. God didn't give them the cliff notes of Exodus chapter 14 and say, by the way, this is what's going to happen now. Just be prepared. No, there's a part, there's a portion that you come to where you focus on, if you focus on the circumstances and all that you can see, listen to me, it's going to drive you crazy. Now, I don't know how God's going to get you out of your mess. You say, well, that's real good. You tell us to trust God. Listen, I don't. I'm not God. I can't tell you tonight how He's going to deliver you through. I can't tell you tonight how He's going to calm your heart. But I just know this. If God can deliver Israel through the Red Sea, why in the world can't God deliver you? We don't always know what God's plan is. And I'll tell you, there's times... Listen, no Israelite could have ever concocted that story. Had the CNN reporter gone up to them and said, Well, y'all are about to die. What's going to happen? I don't think one of them would have stood with a smile on their face and said, Well, I'm going to tell you how this is going to happen. Our leader is going to raise his rod, and that sea is going to spread open, and we're all going to walk across it. Maybe they'd have said, You know, there's going to be a bunch of lifeboats that are going to come over here and... They never could have dreamed up how God was going to deliver them. And can I tell you from my own experience, there are times I never could have even imagined how God was going to help me through a circumstance. But He did. But I'm talking to some here tonight. Listen, you've had the same thing going on in your heart just like the nation of Israel. And may I say, just has happened in my life on many occasions that I care not to acknowledge when I have focused on the, invi or the visible rather than the invisible. But let's continue on. This one's a painful thing to talk about tonight, but it's true. Doubt causes us to call God's character into question. Doubt causes us to call God's character into question. You ever had anybody call your character into question? You know, being raised in the South, if you call somebody a liar, if they've got any sense about their character, those are fighting words. Remember one time I was in a van with a bunch of fellas, and one guy called another one a liar, and it was like you gave both of them pistols and said, just take ten paces and shoot each other. But you know what happens when doubt begins to settle in our souls? You know what? We begin to doubt God's character. We begin to doubt God's love and care for us. Now, I know it's going to get quiet. We begin to doubt and say, "Why, God, do you even love me? God, this is happening in my life. This is happening with my children. Lord, my family is seeing this. God, this is not how I scripted my life. And in our humanity, we begin to doubt God's love and His care. 
After all, did not a songwriter write this? Does Jesus care? When my heart is pain. Now I know we talk about the chorus, oh yes he cares, but I'm talking some of you tonight, you're living in the verses. When you've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me, those questions that are posed in that old hymn, listen to me, they have great depth of the, of the positions that we reach in life. Some of you tonight, when you, need to, when you leave, you need to live in the chorus, not the verses. Oh yes, He cares. I know He cares. His heart is touched with my grief. You're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I've been an imperfect Christian. You say, I know I'm a child of God, but how in the world could God ever love somebody like me? Listen to what God told Israel in Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I know that's not talking to the New Testament church, but I'm going to tell you the character of God's love is the same throughout. You're here tonight and you've been living for the devil and you're a child of God and you've been living in the slums of guilt and you say, there's no way that God could love me. All of these things are happening. Listen to me. As a child of God, God has an enduring love that takes you through the briar patches of discipline. But nonetheless, God still loves you. You know, God gives, you say, does God really care for me right now? I just feel like I'm to the point. God, do you really care? God, why are you allowing this? Listen, God gives you an invitation tonight. Here it is, 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. God basically says, just bring it here. I remember as a kid, when I'd break something, my dad would say, bring it here. Boy, I found myself as a dad saying the same thing. Bring it here and then pray, God, give me wisdom. How do I fix this? You're here tonight. You say, I'm broken. You're here tonight. Your heart is being poured out. God Almighty says, bring it here. But sometimes when we doubt God, we begin to doubt His care. We begin to doubt His love. Give, let me give you a prime example of the, of, of the disciples. This hits close to home. Matthew cha or Mark chapter 4, they're on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is asleep in the boat. The waves are crashing. They think they're going to die. They come down, they wake the Master. And the Bible says in Mark 4.38... And he was in the hinder part of the ship, speaking of Jesus, and asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? I don't think they came in there sterile and all spiritual. You think you're about to die? You'll be amazed at how you talk to God. But you know what? They were brought to the point, carest thou not, Lord, don't you care about our lives? I'm telling you, the same disease that bit the disciples is the same one that's gripped some of our souls tonight. Not only do we doubt God's love and care, sometimes we doubt God's power and His ability. It's, it's one thing to sit in this auditorium and say, I believe God can do anything. You, you're here tonight. If I asked that question, if I looked at every teenager, I said, do you believe that God can do anything? Most of them would say, yes. Oh, if I looked at adults tonight and I said, do you believe that God can do anything? You would say, oh yes, we know what the correct answer is. But sometimes we get so disillusioned and numb in our hearts, we begin to doubt whether He can or not. In Job 42, verse 2, after Job was interrogated by God Almighty. You remember at the end of that book what happens? If you don't, read it. At the end of it, boy, God just gives Job a lecture. He begins firing off questions just like your parents did you. Except God's questions carried a lot more depth. Like, Job, where were you at when I hung the earth? 
Job, what about this? Job, what about this? Do you know how this works? I mean, I am the master architect of creation. And when it's over with, Job looks at God and he says this. He said, I know thou canst do everything and no thought be withholden from thee. Matthew 19, verse 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You know, there's maybe some hurting hearts here tonight. You've doubted God and you've been brought to your knees to even wonder, God, what can be done? Oh, I can tell you, if God can part the Red Sea, God can deliver you. But sometimes we doubt His Word and His promise. Now that's painful to admit. I know that's not the correct thing for good upstanding members of Calvary Baptist Church to do, but have you ever sometimes you've doubted His Word, you've doubted His promise? Sarah did, she laughed. Abraham did, he faltered. God had made it very plain. And sometimes God tells me something very plainly, and I trust my emotions more than I trust God's Word. Now, I'm looking at a room full of emotional creatures in here. Some admittedly more emotional than others. You may say, in our household, we have a drama queen. And they're not always women. Well, listen, there's some of you tonight, you know why you've just slumped down in doubt? I'm going to tell you why you've trusted your feelings more than you've trusted God. I'm going to let you in on a secret. I don't feel saved every day. I'll guarantee you one, time, one thing, your pastor, I'm sure, if I was brought down to the where he's been brought down to physically, listen, I mean, there's some days I probably wouldn't even know where I'm at. And if I lived my life according to that, it'd be a mess. Some of you tonight, you say, oh, preacher, I, I just have all kinds of emotions that just lead me one way or another. Let me let you in on a secret. God's Word is infallible. Your emotions are not. There's times you want to kill somebody. Even if it is figuratively speaking, it's still not good. But you begin to doubt God's Word. You begin to doubt His promise. You know what some of you need to do? Some of you need to be mindful of when you were a kid and your parents made you a promise and how you felt about it. Now there's some of you tonight, you were raised in homes. Maybe your dad just lied like a blue streak up one side and down the other. And because all you knew was lies from your father, you have a hard time trusting God. Hey, your dad and your heavenly father are two different people. But I'm telling you, there's some of you in this room, listen to me. You remember as a kid those promises you got, or even as a parent giving your promises to your kids? My daughter Kara, she's 10 years old, but for a season she was so scared of the dark, I had to go in her room and lay down with her. Now I fixed that with my boys. I said, all right, fellas, you're going to scare her to death, she'll sleep with you tonight, and then when you make up your mind to quit scaring her, then maybe she can sleep in her room. That, that solved it pretty quickly. But I remember one night I was laying in there, and the truth was I didn't really want to be in there in the sense that I wanted my own bed. Now, don't look at me like I'm some carnal-minded person. Horrible father. I'm telling you, when you're laying on a little trundle bed that has a mattress that feels like that carpet on that step, it's just hard to lay down. I'd lay down there beside of her, and she'd be like, Dad, are you going to stay in here all night? I'd say, oh, honey, it was a nice day outside, wasn't it? Man, she'd just be one-tracked, and finally she'd pin me down, and she'd say, Daddy, you are going to stay in here all night, aren't you? And I'd look at her and say, Yes, I will, knowing full well that I would have to sleep in the most uncomfortable bed. But after I said that, I'll never forget one time she looked at me, and she said, Daddy, do you promise... You know, there's some of you parents in this room tonight, you ought to look hard in the eyes of your kids. They take your word just like the Bible, and you say, I would do whatever I can for them. Let me tell you, as good of a parent as you may be, there's a Heavenly Father that trumps what you do. 
You take your desire to help your children and multiply it times a million and you've not even scratched the surface of God's desire for you. But we doubt His Word. And we doubt His promise. But let me quickly go through these last two things. Number five tonight, doubt will flee when you go forward. Doubt will flee when you go forward. You say, well, how do you get rid of doubt? Well, it's not as simple as going to Walmart and getting a bottle of doubt remover. Stain on your tie, stain on your shirt, shout it out, right? Guys, if you get a bad stain, tell your wife it's bad if you don't because she doesn't stain treat it and wash it and she has to burn the shirt, she's going to really put it to you. You say, how do you know that? Brother Vernon told me that. I, I've never done it before in my life. No, I've learned from experience. How do you get rid of doubt? Well, let me, let me show you in verse number 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show to you this day. For the Egyptians who ye have seen today, ye shall see them again. Now listen to how he says this. No more forever. That's pretty dogmatic, isn't it? <laughs> no room for doubt. <laughs> Are we like not going to see them for the next few days? No, God, God said to Moses, Moses, you tell them that they're never going to see them again. Verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. And you know what happens? Moses raises his rod and those faithless Israelites begin to go forward. The problem is with some of us when we doubt God, we want God to spell everything out for us before we get over our doubt. You know, if that's the case, then what we have is no longer faith. You're here tonight. You say, God wants me to go in this specific direction. Then you only have one gear. That's forward. You say, God wants me to do something. that There's no way that I can do it. You've just got one option. That's go forward. And when you do, your doubts and your fleas will pass. And listen, God will deliver you in ways you never could have imagined. But some of us tonight, we choose to be enslaved by doubt. And tonight God says, go forward. But then the last thing I tell you tonight is that some of the sweetest songs you will ever hear come after a season of doubt. Some of the sweetest songs you will ever hear come after a season of doubt. Do you have any favorite songs? I'm not talking about row, row, row your boat. I'm not talking about she'll be coming around the mountain. You ever had songs you come to church and I'm telling you, as soon as the song leader begins to play or begins to announce it, you're like, oh, that's a great song. You know, this episode was so good in the next chapter. You know what Israel did? What Moses did? He wrote a song. Now, I've got to admit and warn you tonight, it doesn't rhyme. I've tried 4-4, four, 3-4, four, four, timing for you musicians. I haven't been able to get it down to any of those. I think the only way you could lead this song is just swat at it. But in chapter 15, notice this. It says, Then sang Moses... And the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, Now listen to this, I will sing unto the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously the horse, and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Verse 2, The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare an habitation for my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name, and it intensifies for an entire chapter. You know, sometimes in order to 
sing a song like it as well with the depth of a Horatio Spafford after losing family members in a tragic accident. God birthed the song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my sinful estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. And you'll be able to sing, it is well with my soul. But he had to cross through those waters first. Some of you right now, tonight, right now you're just in a slaw of faithlessness. I just pray tonight that God would open your ears long enough to hear there's a song. There's a song if you'll go forward. There's something to be said. There's a God to be praised. There's a closeness to be experienced. If you'll choose to go forward. Make a choice tonight to stop doubting God. Let's bow our heads together. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. I'd just like to ask this question tonight. Whenever the music is picked, they can just go ahead and play. I just want to say without any ado tonight, without any 